Welcome to Revitalize and Replant with Mark Clifton, where we equip pastors to take their churches from declining to thriving by pointing them to a new future and a new hope. Join us weekly for encouragement and practical advice in your pastoring journey. Hey, welcome to Revitalize and Replant. I am not Dan Hurst. I don't have Dan's voice, um, but I'll do the best I can. Dan will be here a little later. You got me. I'm Mark Clifton, and I am so delighted to have with us today Jared Wilson from Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, where we are in actually Spurgeon's Library in Spurgeon's podcast studio with Spurgeon's microphone. So uh, it's really a rare experience, you know. Yeah. He had the only podcast studio in Victorian England. And, well, why, uh, why do you have to measure everybody's chest to that's see true. if they could <laughs> preach when he had these microphones? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Missouri Baptist bought this in, uh, in 1910 and put it together and shipped it over here. And, and no, I don't know. We're glad to be here, though, and we're glad to have Jared with us. And you know, one of the greatest things, Jared, uh, about you is just the way you communicate so clearly and so plainly, uh, right? speaks right to the heart of people, right to my heart on many occasions. Every time you write something, I, I'm, I'm really anxious to read it. And then you got a brand new book, Jesus, Friend of Sinners. It's called Friendship with the Friend of I Sinners. I got it wrong. <laughs> I got it wrong. I, was, I had it out there, and I was looking at it, and I, I practiced it. Friendship with the Friend of Sinners. Oh. But yeah, Jesus is a friend of sinners. He is a friend of sinners. I heard that somewhere, yeah, yeah. right? There may be a song about that. <laughs> Oh, here's a copy oh, of the book. Oh, look at that. Yeah, where was we, that we 20 it. seconds ago, Where man? was that when you need it? <laughs> All right. Anyway, thank you. Man, I love it. I read, I read uh, man, I sit down and I, I read the entire introduction. Okay. <laughs> I know that's a lot for you. So. It was. Yeah, yeah. It took me quite a while. Uh, man, the introduction was great. I okay. mean, the, oh, per- all right. It, it's I only mean, downhill from there. Well, I know. It, you know. No, it was great because I, I, I want you to talk about it. But okay. the introduction really, really – Pulled me into it uh, because in the introduction you do talk about um, just sometimes the incredible loneliness you felt. And um, anyway, it's, this isn't about me, but that I resonated with that in many ways. Hmm. And uh, I'm I'm just delighted for this book. So talk to us about it. Why did you write it? And you know all the regular questions. Everybody's the dozens of people who listen to this are really anxious <laughs> to hear. So well. The seed of it, I think, was planted years ago when um, it was over a meal, I think, with, uh, with Ray Ortland, and he directed or redirected my attention to Exodus 33, verse 11, where it says, And thus the Lord uh, spoke to Moses face to face like one would a friend. And it just latched into my heart. I, I don't know that I did a whole lot with it except just sort of ruminate on it and it I think it just began to kind of seep into my awareness what that means oh I don't know if I knew what it meant like okay face to face you can't see the glory of God and live right there's the whole deal he's got to hide himself in the cleft of the rock so the backside of God's glory you know glory goes by um, his face is you know radiating when he comes off the mount all of these things but then it says face to face like one would a friend, and I, I think it means there's a spiritual intimacy there. I mean, it could be a Christophany, I suppose, that the mm-hmm. Son of God somehow pre-incarnate appearance, but I think it more is just about the closeness he had with God was like a friendship. It was like a personal friendship. And later, I kind of drew a line from that to John 15, where Jesus says to his disciples in in verse 15, I no longer call you servants. Servants don't know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends. I have revealed everything to you from my father. And I'd just been mulling that around for years, and it was coming out in in other books. It was coming out of my preaching, this idea of friendship with Jesus, and uh, the provost here at the at the seminary, uh, Dr. Jason Dusing, he was encouraging me to do something with this friendship with Jesus idea because I had little runs and sermons about it. And mm-hmm. I did a blog post about it. And right. he was like, this is a book. Yeah. And I thought, well, everybody knows about 
a personal relationship with Jesus. Well, like, I was going yeah, <laughs> I, I was gonna say that. that we, in yeah. your introduction, you say you know, re, it's not a. People always say uh, it's a relationship, not a religion. They're right, right? Yeah. And so that's, that's not a foreign concept to evangelicals, <laughs> and certainly not to Baptists. Um, but I think, in a way, it is because we have the li- the lingo, uh-huh. and I and I think that a lot of us. Um, well, I'll just speak for myself. I, I think for a long time I was content to have a relationship with the idea of Jesus. Yes, the concept of Jesus. And um, in the book, I'm trying to f- to well, I guess flesh out would be the word that I would use that he's a real person, <laughs> and we can have a relationship with the real person of Jesus. That's what the book is about. Yeah, it's yeah. great. And I think one of the reasons in, in my own life, as I as I looked at it, um, you know, I grew up in church. I, I, I it, it, I've lived inside the evangelical ghetto all my life, so I'm familiar with all the lingo, like you said, and and I can quote it all back. But at the end of the day, um, oftentimes, uh, I I know how bad I am. I know how prone to sin I am. I know how undisciplined I am. And I still struggle sometimes with the idea that Christ wants to be my close, intimate friend. That anybody knew me that well— yeah really wouldn't want to because you know a lot of people who who compliment us on stuff and and you know tell us all this they don't really know us right yeah and so you know he knows us i know he knows me and and even i do i struggle with that so i'm anxious to even read more about this because i think it resonates even in in my life um you know we live our lives or, or so many of us do projecting some kind of image whether it's social media or just you know walking down the street and right and i think even in church or in in you know sad to say sometimes especially in church right where we feel like that's the place where we have to be the most guarded because we have to maintain some sort of respectability religiously or otherwise we send our religious avatar to church every sunday you exactly know? Um, i look put together everything's fine but you know every, from the you know the, the instagrammable life to everything else i think we're just so much in this mode of you know, trying to look our best self, that it seeps into how we think of God and our yeah. in, in interaction with Him. That, which is just so funny, because we we all know. I mean, He sees right through it. We we know that He cannot be fooled. <laughs> I mean, we know that. I, I'm, I, you know, I'm. I don't believe that Christians think they can fool God, but we act like we can. Right. And we, and and I guess you know what I would love for more of us to do is to just have the cur- the courage and the freedom to just drop that pretense because God will only deal with us. I- I'm convinced of this. God will only deal with our real self. He He doesn't interact with the fake version of us, the idealized version of us. He'll only meet us on the playing field of reality. So wow. to the extent that we're pretending or hiding or faking is the extent to which we're, we, we won't be enjoying, you know, uh, deep communion with him. So friendship. Uh, in the title of the book, yeah. but yet, I mean, oh man, what does it mean, right? <laughs> I mean, seriously, yeah. you talk about it on social media, you talk about yeah. you know friends on social media and all that. I think you even mentioned in the in the again in the introduction uh, about maybe our fathers were part of Rotary, yeah, and and we they had some friends maybe kind of yeah. like that. And and what do we you know? I think you yeah, like fraternal orders and just yeah. different things like that. Bowling leagues. I mean, yeah. Roger Putman, um, probably thirty years or so ago, wrote. The book uh, Bowling Alone, right. which is about the decline, and and it, and that just became sort of a, a metaphor for just the decline of kind of social matrices. And we have, I think, again, we have like the image of this with like the coffee shop culture and everything. Yeah, but the coffee shops and stuff are places where people can all go be alone together. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Everyone's exactly. in there on their fo- with their headphones <laughs> on or their earbuds, and the, yeah, you know, and, you know, obviously there's conversations and things that take place, but um, yeah, I, I just think the the online world and everything else has made us more socially awkward and more socially um, disconnected, which is such a, a great irony because the internet is premised on connecting all of us. So we're more connected than we've ever been. Right. We're more lonely than we've ever been. And it's become, I think, for a lot of places are, are waking up to this as a public health crisis. So, I mean, there's been studies, of course, um, in the Western world where they've connected, for middle-aged men in particular, because of the decline of some of these things, our fathers and grandfathers, they were more, you know, they had more friendships than mm-hmm. than guys my age in particular. And they're connecting loneliness to rates of depression and then, of course, suicides and things like that. In Japan, they actually have 
governmental positions assigned to like, you know, the minister of loneliness and, and things like that, because it's such a, um, and, and Japan is a very densely populated right. place. It's not a sparsely populated nation. Um, and yet the, the feeling of loneliness is so pronounced. And so I, I set that up in the, in the book just to talk about, we have a problem with friendship exactly. to begin with. Right. And then you translate that over to my friendship with a holy God who I cannot see. Right. At least not yet, um, and it just further complicates our conception of fellowship with God. And again, nothing new here, but social media has has made it even easier for us to to put on a face front, a false front rather, yeah. and uh, and look different to the world. And uh, and then I think that does in my life. It can even uh, move over into my relationship with God. I, I kind of want to put it on that front with Him. And like you said, when I do that, I have no I have no real connection at all. He doesn't. I love what you said. He doesn't deal with my phony self. Yeah. Only with my real self. Okay, so what's this book supposed to do to people who read it? What do you hope <laughs> happens to them? Yeah, well, I hope that they will, um, through my own transparency, I tell you know quite a few personal stories in it and, and try to show a bit of my heart um, in the book. And I try to show them the kind of friend Jesus is. So I begin with this idea of friendship, the, the, the problems that we have with friendship, and then talk about the possibility of friendship with Jesus, what that looks like. But then I just spend the rest of the chapters talking about what kind of friend Jesus is. And I, I you know, believe, you know, biblically that people are changed by seeing the glory of Christ. That if I want people to know Christ and be close to Christ, I have to show them Jesus. Not just tell them, mm-hmm. but actually show them. And so, um, you know, I talk about the different facets of, of friendship with Christ and that he's a generous friend, that he's a, a safe friend, that he's an available friend, he's a generous friend. And of course, a saving friend, and just step by step, you know, try to um, help people see uh, what kind of friend Jesus is. Because if we can see him as he is, I think we'll be more willing for him to see us as we are, or at least we'll enjoy uh, and not be afraid of him seeing us. So, what kind of change? What kind of change would take place in a person's life when they come to the realization that he really is? a real friend and knows me better than anybody in the world, but yet yeah. doesn't run away from me, runs to me. What, what, how does that change us? Yeah. Well, I'll just start on the level of like the spiritual discipline. So I talk about how, you know, seeing our relationship with Christ as a friendship changes the way I read the Bible, that I don't read the Bible purely as an intellectual exercise. And I also don't read it um, as a means of trying to kind of earn points, you know, with the big man upstairs, yeah. like I'm earning credit. Or, got, or check it off your yeah, list. Yeah, let me get my gold star for the day. Right. You know, I read my Bible, that sort of thing. But I'm he's speaking to me. My friend is talking to me. When I open this book, the voice of God is there. The Holy Spirit has breathed out these words. So if I want to have, if I want to experience Jesus talking to me like one would a friend, I open that Bible and, and I come to that with a different mentality. In prayer as well, which I think is where a lot of people really struggle, right? Because mm-hmm. scripture reading is somewhat tangible. I can mark off. I read four verses or whatever. Right. With prayer, I sometimes feel like I'm just, you know, throwing popcorn into outer space or something. It's like I can't see him. He doesn't respond audibly. You know, my mind wanders, etc. But if I remember he's a real person and he's really there, I'll speak more naturally. Um, I won't be afraid of my mind wandering or even falling asleep because I know my friend is still going to be there and he's not going to judge me. And it's good. He's so eager to hear from me. So a spiritual disciplines change, but then just my general demeanor. I don't have to put up an image on social media or at church or anywhere else if if the one who reigns and rules accepts me as I am and clothes me in his righteousness. If I'm hidden, like Paul says, if I'm hidden with Christ in God, I have nothing left to hide. And so it transforms just the way I live my daily life. I, I don't have to put out my religious avatar out there. You know, I don't have to show this idealized version of myself because if God's for me, who can be against me? It, it has a total, uh, a totally transformative effect on just my outlook on life. I think it would be really impactful. You know, most of our audience are pastors who are pastoring really declining churches. You know, mm-hmm. that's why the title of the podcast is. Revitalize and replant. It's yeah. not mega church 101, all right? <laughs> yeah, okay. So we don't yeah. not many mega church pastors saying, hey, yeah. we got to tune in and see what those dudes are talking Forget about today. Forget those guys. Yeah. But a lot of the guys <laughs> who listen to us are really struggling. And um, and, and really, I, I think sometimes they, they, they feel insecure about what they're doing. Their mm. church is perhaps declining. They're in a place where people look at them and go, man, that's a little church. That's a dying church. And I, I think 
we experience sometimes they, they feel some real disconnect from other pastors. They feel lonely. And, um, and sometimes as they take their church through, navigate it through change, they become the subject of hostility from their congregation. Yeah. And I think this book, where they realize, I, I don't need affirmation of my congregation. I don't need affirmation of my peers. I got all the affirmation I need in, in the friendship I have with Christ. Talk about how that might change yeah. a pastor's heart. Well, just the confidence, first of all, to do what's right, to do what's wise in the face of opposition or doubt, or even just of your own of your own doubt, you know? I mean, I, I, I've only pastored small churches, so, mm-hmm. um, you know, I've been in big churches, but I've only pastored small churches, and um, I know the experience well of even if people are behind you, hey, we're behind you, pastor. Yeah, yeah. They, so they don't, you know, they don't get it, but in my own heart, I'm like, what if this blows up? Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, like, there's not a lot of room for error here, right. you know? We're trying to grow this thing. I, I want people to know Jesus, and just have my own anxiety and my own doubt, and what I love is that Christ doesn't regard us based on the size of our church. He doesn't regard us based on the impact, you know, the crater of our ministry, you know, the the impact that it leaves and, you know, the legacy we're building. He relates to us based purely on his own grace and as, as human beings. And so in some sense, having, you know, less to offer him, quote unquote, you know, uh, fewer resources, uh, you know, uh, less shiny stuff, um, you know, fewer accomplishments. Um, I think it actually make us it it makes us more um, more ripe, more able to experience His goodness because there's nothing else to deaden us or medicate us, right? It's, in this, it's a similar thing to um, when all of my um, supports, idols, everything else is kind of knocked out from under me. I I see the goodness of Christ as truly good because he is my he, he's my only good. Um, when, when I was in a you know, per, you know significant period of depression and and um, and despondency, I mean you know suicidal and the whole bit, um, Christ came near and it, it just it wakened me to the reality that the gospel was for me as a Christian. I just always thought the you know the gospel is for lost people, mm-hmm. and and then I discovered no like there's grace for me as a believer, um, not just the forgiveness of my sins, but the the imputation of his righteousness and so on and so forth. And what I came to uh, I think be convinced of is that for most folks, um, Christ doesn't become their only hope until he is their only hope, mm-hmm. right? First uh, Thessalonians chapter 1, um, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. I think this is in verse 6. You became imitators of us and of the Lord because you received the word in the midst of much affliction. Mm. And I think guys who are struggling in their churches, or, you know, maybe it's not a struggle, but it's just it's just hard work. It's, you know, maybe things aren't against them, but they're trying to build something, re, you know, have a resurgence there. And um, they maybe have a keener, uh, a keener um, sense of the closeness of Christ, or can, because there's less stuff to distract them by, and they know their need more. Why do you think, Mark? <clears throat> whenever a celebrity comes to Jesus, mm-hmm. it's always a celebrity after their career was a big deal. You know? Isn't that true? We don't. <laughs> or, we don't or, get the Tom Cruises no. or the Tom Hankses. We get the well. I won't name names. Well, or or some, I'm sure, some. I'm sure Judge Reinhold's listening to right, this, but or right. Gary Busey. But we always get the guys yeah. a, after there has yeah. you know their has been's. Why do you think those guys come to Jesus? Yeah, I think it's because. All, all the stuff that they had trusted in before has now slipped out of their hands. That's right. And they know their need bigger. So I think replanters, revitalizers, the, I think people are, you know, going through those sort of, they know their need right. more than the big shiny church guys. And they need to know that uh, the friendship with the friend of sinners is where their real joy and confidence yeah. comes from. Jesus loves the big shiny church guys too, though. He does. Yeah. This, is, does. this podcast isn't for them. No, it's but not. But let's not be disdainful of those guys. I would guys. agree with yeah. that. We need their money in buildings. So. <laughs> Amen. We couldn't keep this podcast going without them, right? That's right. They're funding our disdain. They are. Them. It works out really well that way. And since they don't listen, they don't even really know how much disdain there might be. Uh, okay, one last thing. And again, okay. I really want to I really want to commend this book to you. Um, it's called Friendship with the Friend of Sinners by Jared Wilson. It is Baker House Books. There's a link in the show notes. There I love go. saying that. It yeah. makes me sound so important. It's the you know, show. It's the big the show. show no- the big show notes. <laughs> we have a link in the show notes down there. Uh, so, yeah, get this book. Yeah, uh, really, uh, it'll be a blessing to you, and it'll really help your ministry and your walk with Christ. And the last thing I want to ask you here is yeah. when you have this 
the friendship with the friend of sinners, how does that make you a better friend to other people? Oh, my. Did you ever think about that? Yeah, well, of course. Okay. <laughs> So no, here's, so no, here's Mark, the thing. I never thought about that. <laughs> in, in Life Together, uh, the book Life Together, Dietrich Bonhoeffer talks about um, this facade that we put on ourselves. And uh, we meet each other. He talks about that we come to church um, as religious persons mm-hmm. and not as sinners. He says the breakthrough to, to, to true fellowship cannot occur because we, we relate to each other as religious persons and not as sinners. If I relate to Christ as a sinner, knowing that he's not, um, he doesn't approve of my sin, but he loves me as a sinner, that's the whole reason he came, to, to seek and save that which is lost. He died on the cross for sinners. So he relates to me as I really am. That now frees me up to drop the pretense that I'm not a sinner. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, Bonhoeffer says, uh, you know, churches can be sometimes horrified when a sinner is found in their midst, you know? <laughs> and that's what happens. Like, somebody's got to take the risk to say, hey, guess what, guys? I'm a mess. Yeah. Um, I have problems. I have issues. This is, you know, I need to confess this sin, or, you know, I'm not as smart as you think I am, or as smart as I, I want you to think I am. When someone takes that risk, um, it's usually because they know the approval of Jesus. If I if I really know the approval of Jesus, then I can risk your disapproval of me. Wow. I can come out from hiding. John, you know, talks about this in um, in, in in First John. He says, "If we walk in the light, as He is in the, in the light," and then he says something really astounding: "We have fellowship with one another." He doesn't just say fellowship with God. Mm-hmm. If we're walking in the light, we do have fellowship with God. But he doesn't say that. He says with one another, and I think it's. Like, if, if we're not walking in the light, we don't really have fellowship with one another. We have fellowship with one another's religious avatars, right, with exactly. each other's, you know, fake selves. And so I think, you know, the more real my friendship with Christ is, the more I can relate to others with with confidence because you, if you reject me, I'll be okay. Right. Or if you judge me, I'll be okay. Right. But also humility. I can love you and accept you and forgive you. Um, because I know what Christ has done for me, right? That's the the vertical becoming the horizontal that is all throughout the Scriptures, but especially the great commandment and so on and so forth. Well, again, the people who listen to this, so many of them are, are, are friends, and they're working in some challenging situations. And they talk about loneliness being one of their primary yeah. mm-hmm. uh, issues that they deal with, um, not having friendships, not having relationships, feeling cut off and alone. Uh, again, so if, if you guys would just really dive into this book, um, and understand what it means to have a friendship with Christ, then it will free you up to have a friendship with, with others. It's amazing how isolated we can become in ministry yeah. uh, and how withdrawn we can become because we're trying to protect, as you said, yeah. our image, and we don't want people to see yeah. who we really are. Well, leadership is lonely to begin with, it is. Well, no matter what you know, your context or your size, but then if you add in that you're distanced from other folks and it just compounds that yeah. sense of loneliness, I know. Thank you, man. I yeah. appreciate you being here. I appreciate the book. I appreciate your ministry and your friendship. Um, but, you know, we do have something here with guests we call the final four. Oh, okay. These are four last questions. Final four, all right. And some of them are better than others. It's like lightning round? Is it, it the it, same four questions you ask No, no, time? no, no. We, 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 divine, we design them specifically okay. now for— Now you know I don't listen to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm one of those big church guys that doesn't— No, I'm just kidding. I don't—I'm not— <laughs> What a rousing yeah. endorsement. Hey, I'll come be on your podcast to peddle my book, but I'm not going to listen to it. You already shot, and I was like, you have a podcast? You have a podcast? <laughs> really? Isn't that special? <laughs> you do it in your bedroom? Hey, what? do you listen to mine? I, I do. No, you don't. No, I don't, yeah, actually. Okay, all right. Then. Yeah, now we're even. <laughs> I will. Maybe. All right. Yeah. If, you're, if, you're, if you're in your car or whatever you're alone, you're listening to some great music, are you more likely to, to play air drums or air guitar? Um, I, I, uh, air drums. Air drums. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you up in the Northeast. Would you prefer lobster or barbecue? Oh, lobster. Really? Yeah. Because right. it's it's harder to get. That's true. It's more rare. You, yeah. It's, I throw it's, a rock out my window here. I hit barbecue. That's true. And, you and can, I'm from Texas originally. So and you can barbecue. catch a cow. It's hard to catch a lobster. <laughs> that's true. It's true. Yeah. Right? Okay. Um, I, I, this is a long story. Uh, never mind. <laughs> I, I was I was I was actually Four in PEI. I was I was doing some preaching in PEI. Okay, right? yeah. And the the pastor was a bivocational pastor, and he was a lobsterman. Oh wow! And he said, "I'd like to take you out in the morning." And I'm thinking, I've looked at that water. It looks really rough, and I don't want to get sick and throw up and look like an idiot. Yeah, yeah. So I said, "No, I, I, that's okay. I'm gonna. You know, I appreciate it, but no." 
Now, then I realized he brought the – we had him for breakfast. We had fresh lobster for breakfast. That's amazing. And he brought him in, and I realized he doesn't go out there. It's, they're just right off the coast in these traps, you know. That's so right. I could have been uh. there. I could have done that. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So anyway, okay, you say, you say lobster. Yeah, I say All lobster. Right. All right. I, I can't believe I'm asking this, but here we go. Uh-huh. Are you a phone in the bathroom guy or not a phone in the bathroom guy? <laughs> phone in the bathroom guy. Okay, good. Yeah. Just want to know that. And then, where, where else am I going to do the wordle? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then, this is, this is a question we ask everybody, okay. all right? If there's only two kinds of music in the world and you have to pick, right? You're on, you're on, a, you're on a desert island and you only yeah. get two kinds of music. Okay. Southern gospel or bluegrass? Oh, uh, bluegrass. Oh, you win. Yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, we'll send you this prize. We have a fine collection of motel soaps that we've collected from across North America. All right. And we'll send you a box of those. You know uh, what? Yeah. You can keep them. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Jared. It's great to have you with Thank us. Thank you, Bart. Thanks for joining us today on Revitalize and Replant. This podcast is brought to you by the North American Mission Board, where we help dying or struggling churches regain health for the glory of God and the good of their communities. If you found this conversation helpful, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. To learn more about becoming a replanting pastor or to explore resources about revitalization for your own church, visit churchreplanters.com.